Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is a man who has a story to tell that comes from the heart of Germany's recent history and very much from his own heart. And here he is, Walter Kohl. Thank Hello. you very much for joining us today on Talking Germany. Thanks for having me. Great stuff. Now, uh, Yes, it is a familiar name, and yes, Walter Kohl is the son of the former German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, but the two have not had a happy relationship, which prompted Walter Kohl to sit down and write a book that helped him to reconcile himself with some very difficult chapters in his life. So I'm very grateful that Walter Kohl has joined us today to talk about history, some of it very personal, and healing and reconciliation in general. These are our topics. Battling against bullying, it's thought that more than half of the kids at German schools are at some time victims of bullying, so how best to tackle the problem? Living in a bubble, many well-known people need bodyguards, but it's not much fun having them around, as Walter Kohl discovered as a child. And who needs them? More and more young people are saying no to cars and choosing bikes and trains instead. We ask, how are the car makers responding? Walter Kohl, thank you very, very much once again for joining us. Now, I want to begin immediately with your book, which you've written and which came out a year or so ago, Live Your Life or Be Lived. It's a very, very interesting title, and I'd like you to explain for us a little bit about what you were trying to achieve with the book and with the title. Well, the title basically is a capsule of my little story, because way back when I was born in 1963, in the 70s and definitely also in the 80s, I was lived. I was lived as somebody who is only looked at as a function, as a son of, not as his own little self. And uh, only much later, through reconciliation, through what I call the inner conversion of energy, I managed to become myself, to de determine myself, to form my own life. And that has become not only the theme of my book, but also the theme of talks and seminars that I do. And many people very much respond to that issue. So I suppose we can, we can call it a therapeutic process. I would call it a healing process, mm -hmm. because therapeutic sounds so much like hospital and all okay, these things. Yeah. It's a way of dealing with yourself and resetting the, the inner being of oneself. Because we start out with certain dreams, with certain notions of how we would want our life to be. However, life doesn't <laughs> go always in that direction. Absolutely. And at some point, sooner or later, we have to reconcile all these things and to create our own little path. And that, if you so want, is my mission. Fascinating stuff. Uh, Walter Kohl, the name Walter is, is very interesting in itself because it's a, it's a relatively common name still here in Germany. But you were called Walter for a very specific reason. Indeed. My father had an older brother, Walter, who died as a very young soldier at age 18, 19, just before the end of the war, late 1944. Mm. And when the terrible news came, he said to my grandmother, his mother, mum, my first son will be called Walter, Walter. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, I inherited that. That's, that, that's, that's very interesting. And uh, what it reveals a little bit, when we talk about your father's personal history there, yeah. it's very much part of German history. And you and he, I mean, you ha you've had your conflict, and we don't really need to talk about the details of that, but it's very interesting. There's a generational conflict there. He was one generation and you were another generation. Yeah. Could you describe those two generations for um, us? My father is born in 1930, my mother in 1933, both were teenagers during the war. Both were very much scarred by the bombing raids, by the experiences of incredible pain, incredible suffering, uh, losing home, being a refugee in the case of my mother, and all these terrible in incidents. So there is a generation, we call that the children of the war in Germany, mm -hmm. and the children of the children of, of the war, they have a very different life set, a very different feeling. And if I uh, go through my uh, sp uh, speaking events and all these things, and there were more than 10,000 people in all these events last year, this is a big theme. A lot of people, my generation, have a emotional communication problem with their parents. So the war, in a way, still transcends across generations. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, another thing that we saw in in that report that we, we, we you talked about how much your father worked. I yeah. mean, he was he was a he was a man who was totally committed to what he a was doing. A workaholic, in the very <laughs> he much. He was a worker. He was Absolutely. a workaholic. Yeah. yeah. But uh, when we talk about the generational thing, that that was really. I mean, because I'm the same generation as you, pretty much. That was mm. pretty much the norm. Nobody expected their father to be around. I think uh, it depends. In my hometown, Ludwigshafen, everybody worked at a big chemical factory, BASF, and there were normal family lives. So the lives of my, the family lives of my schoolmates were mm. quote unquote normal. Mm -hmm. My father always been, has been an outstanding person in that sense. My father is an extremely talented political person, just like somebody who plays the piano very well or who is a gifted sportsman. He has mm. to do what he has to do. But in doing that, obviously, other things fall to the side. And this is precisely what happens with, I think, anybody's family where one member is extremely gifted in one part of life. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about reconciliation and the process of coming to terms with the experience that you went through, which yeah. was, a, it's a difficult experience being the son of a, somebody who has such a prominent position. I know you got together with... Um, Lars Brandt and Sven mm. Georg uh, Adenauer, sons yep. of German chancellors, uh, the first German chancellor Adenauer, and then mm. Willy Brandt. Uh, what was it, how helpful was that? Well, we only met once, so that was not uh -huh. a fundamental thing. The the key point is not so much your father being a political figure, but what does your environment make of it? In my case, I was uh, as a young child, as a teenager in the full wang, so to speak, of the terrorist movement in the 70s. That was a very, very big influence on my life. And the second thing is the ideological time, or the ideological uh, thinking of those times very much inflicted pain on my life because it was an us and them decision, uh, discussion, very much different from today. So being somebody's father by itself is not the issue. It is what makes the environment of it. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what, one thing that I know that your parents always said to you apparently was that uh, you know, it's not just a challenge for you, but it's also there are huge opportunities involved in the lifestyle that you had and the, 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 the place where you were as a young person. No, they never said it that way. They simply said, this is the way life is. Take it. Du musst stehen, you have to stand through it. Mm -hmm. That was their message. And unlike in other societies, German politicians uh, come and go. My father is an exception in terms of him being so long in power. Mm -hmm. But uh, you don't create riches in Germany. There are other countries that uh, I know from the States or even from Britain, um, where the political system is very different. It caters for people who have assumed responsibility mm -hmm. for the time after. That is not true in Germany. We have a very different sense of uh, how do we deal with people and political power. Okay, okay. Um, you, when we do talk about, however, about opportunity, about where you were, you were certainly sort of in the front row for the whole process of German reunification, yeah. which was your, your, your father's sort of great achievement. Yeah. How did you experience that time, sort of 1989, 1990? Well, as I have put it in my book, it was probably the best year of my life, or mm. one of the best years of my life. Personally, we were very close. We had a lot of discussions. I was in the final year of my economics degree. Uh, let's just have a look. Uh, ah. There's a, there's a photo that we can see yeah, just there. Yeah, that's the Brandenburg Gate opening, yeah, in 1989. This Christmas. is the time you're talking about. This is the time we're talking about. Yeah. To us, especially for my mother, who had enormous influence on my father in terms of the strategic issues of concerning unification, unification was a God's present. It was just wonderful. And I remember <coughs> this being as both a time of great uncertainty because nobody knew what would happen the next week or the next month and also a time of great joy because literally walls came down, not just the physical Berlin Wall, but also walls of thinking, walls of convictions. This has to be in such and such way. No, it doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. Things can be very different. And so that to me became a very, very profound experience. You said something there that I think is very interesting that certainly is new for me, the role of your mother as a counsellor for your father yeah. during this historic yeah. time. Just tell us a little bit more about that. That's My mother is uh, born in Berlin. She grew up in Leipzig, mm -hmm. then East Germany, was a refugee in 1945. And my mother was a very, very stern advocate all her life that Germany should be united, which in the 70s sounded 
almost obscure. So when you were sitting around the dinner table at the weekend with your mother and perhaps your father there, your mother was saying this, and how, how plausible did that seem to you? No, as a my young... mother would say things like, we are going to Leipzig to mm -hmm. visit friends, we yeah. are going to East Germany, mm -hmm. we're not going on vacation to Spain. And that was very unusual in the 70s in Germany. Mm -hmm. And my mother, in, when the time was... Uh, in the summer of 1989, when you know the Budapest and Prague embassy events uh, happened and the first refugees came through Austria and all that, she would always say, no matter what happens, we cannot possibly let go of NATO. We have to stay together with the Americans. There is no option as a third neutral way. And that was an absolute firm affirmative from her. And my father, if I may say so, would have not dared to come home with a different option. So in a way, the refugee child of 1945, the 12-year-old that was beaten on the road by the Russian army, mm -hmm. became one of the fiercest opponents of the Soviet government in 1989. You always meet twice. That's incredible. Wonderful insights. Thank you very much for that. You were focusing on the word victim. That yes. seems to be the central word for you. Yeah. Tell me why. Because victim is a state of mind. In my book, I write about victim's land, Opferland. Mm -hmm. And people who are bullied usually are in victim's land. They are emotionally different from whatever group environment they're in. They are looked at as weak. They can be picked on, just like the examples we saw in the, in the trailer. And this is exactly my experience in the 70s. I was different. I was the guy with the big father. I was the guy with all the terrorist stuff attached to it. I was the guy who was driven to school by uh, special police forces and, 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 and. Mm -hmm. And it could be different color of skin. It could be religious differences, no matter what. As soon as you are different, then you are prone to be a victim. Something very banal, I must say, that occurs to me when you're saying that. I mean, everybody is different but some are more different than others. Ah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the key point. If yeah. you go to a typical German school, mm -hmm. you, are, you have basically a bell-shaped kind of situation. You have uh, the average, so to speak. and The then norm you have in the middle. The norm, is a better yeah. word. Yeah. And you have those at the tail ends. Yeah. And those are prone to be victims mm -hmm. because they're not commanding the spirit of the majority. But hey, you're talking about, you, you, you say victims is almost, you, you, you're suggesting, you seem to be suggesting that it's almost a, a state of mind. It can become Yeah, I take your point, but, the, but I mean, you were, you were kicked to the ground. What, what happened to you? Well, there's two things that happened. As a physical experience, that's minor, and then there's... That's the, minor? Yes, absolutely. Because when those things happened to me at school, they weren't minor. Well, no, no. Please, there is a physical experience that's minor mm -hmm. and then there is the emotional, the spiritual experience that lasts for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. It is not the fact that I get beaten up that hurts. It's the fact that I couldn't do anything about it. It's the fact that I felt hopeless, that I felt um, almost as if I was pinned down by some force and I couldn't fight back. It's self-esteem that goes out of the window. You can remember the actual feeling. I can Absolutely. Tell. It's I can to tell. me, it's yeah. like a movie in my mind mm. that I can almost like insert, like a DVD type yeah. movie. Yeah. And the key point to me is that movie will stay with me. It mm. is a reality. It is something that has never left me. But do I look at it in anger, in fear, or do I look at it as potential reconciled energy that I can now use for different purposes? Mm -hmm. Just like sitting here today in the show with you and talking about it in order to um, help other people who are maybe a bit more in that victim land to come out of it. So I'm not saying change reality. I'm mm -hmm. saying change your perception, your emotions with respect to reality. Mm -hmm. Can you say with good conscience that you never bullied anybody else? No, I bullied people also. Uh -huh. Every victim has the ability to become uh, a tater, somebody who... A perpetrator, a perpetrator. in that sense, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's part of that uh, polarity of life, this yin and yang type thing, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Many people who are victims in one situation of life become perpetrators in a different situation of life. And then it becomes a vicious circle. Mm -hmm. And I definitely was bullying people. Mm -hmm. I definitely was striking back.
mm-hmm. but I always thought of myself as somebody who has been hit first and I had a right to strike back. Now, how do you get out of that vicious circle? Mm-hmm. You don't get out of it by seeking revenge or seeking some sort of abstract justice. You get out of it by seeking inner peace, which I call reconciliation. And the reconciliation has to go back all the way to the source. And the source is that little videotape in your soul <laughs> of that situation. Mm-hmm. That's why in my book, I described such scenes just like in a videotape, the death of my mother, certain experiences in school, to tell people two things. Look, this is what I have experienced and this is what I make of it. And I'm not ashamed to talk about it. Maybe you can be also not ashamed and also talk about it. Mm. And that's my message. I'm a bit nervous to ask the next question, but... Uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> go ahead anyways. <laughs> I'm going to anyway. How much do you miss your mother? I miss my mother because I love her. Mm. And uh, she's gone through suicide, so there was no goodbye. And that's why I take her heritage, her spirit in my life. I, I'm part of her continuation, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And there's no need to be afraid of that question because... Yeah, but it's your life. I'm a, it's I, my I, life. You know, I'm, a, I'm a guy on television. It's your life. It's yeah. my life, sure. Mm. But the key point here is the following. My mother is dead. She took certain uh, decisions which I think are not my decisions, Mm. but I respect and accept that this is her decision. And I say, you live through me. And by virtue of me talking about suicide in public in my uh, speaking engagements, I'd say your death was not meaningless because I can help people not to commit suicide. And I know today of three people who have told me that, that they are not committing suicide because I could help them a little bit of the way to find a new way out of their old dilemma. So they sought that conversation with you? Yeah. And you helped them? Yeah, you can check in my website. One guy mm. even wrote it in the public domain uh, feedback section. He said, I'm not taking the pills. Your book has helped me greatly. I'm giving it a second shot. Mm. And that is meaning in the very much of the Viktor Frankl sense of meaning. And this is what I want to do. And this is why I'm doing this. I'm not doing this to show off and to say, oh, how terrible was my life or anything like that. No, that's not the issue. The issue is everybody has their backpack. Mm -hmm. Everybody has things they have to reconcile one way or another, some more, some less. And all I want to do is I want to give an impulse. I want to show a third path, not just fight and fleeing, but reconciliation as the third option. Okay. The emotional third way. We were talking about bullying just a second ago Mm. and talking about threats to personal safety here in Germany and elsewhere too. There's been a large increase in the number of companies offering security and bodyguard services in recent years. There are clearly enough people around who feel that they require such services, but many of those same people would admit that it's no fun having somebody tracking your every movement. Danger lurks everywhere. That's why Prince Albert of Monaco, the German pop star Nena, and former boxer Henry Maske have all hired her, Birgit Hotmansberger. She's a bodyguard, a woman in a traditionally male field. As a woman, one advantage is that I'm not quite as obvious. I can play different roles, wife, girlfriend, daycare worker, whatever. Women can play different roles and they aren't as obvious. I can wear an evening gown or I can put on an apron and go somewhere dressed as a maid. It's basically like being an actress, playing a role. Birgit Hartmannsberger used to work as a tax accountant. Today, she runs her own security firm. It's tough work. We get very close to our clients. When we're practically living with them, we see them get up in the morning and see what they're doing, what mood they're in. That's important, too, because if they're in a bad mood, we have to be extra careful. Keeping them safe is our job. Birgit jets around the world for her celebrity clients, like to Monaco. We have to keep our eyes and ears open. You never know what might come from a window, from above, from in front, in back. You have to be prepared for anything. Birgit also teaches at a security academy. 
She has plenty of practical experience to offer her students and knows how quickly a seemingly ordinary situation can become life-threatening. We had a plastic surgeon and someone took a shot at him. Luckily, it just hit the side of the chair. So my staff grabbed him and got him out of there and kept him safe. But other times, her job is protecting her celebrity clients' privacy. Often my clients just want to be left in peace. They just want to be able to have a meal without someone coming up and bothering them, asking for an autograph. Being a bodyguard also means making sure the client's environment is secure. This hotel room gets a careful check. I'm looking for things that don't belong here. My boys have already checked, so there shouldn't be anything. But I'm looking for listening devices, explosives, anything that doesn't belong. There's no way to hide anything behind here. The room is secure, so Birgit calls to tell her client and staff to come up. Yes, Zimmer is safe. You can talk come. When Birgit does have a day off, she likes to relax. But it's not always easy to take her mind off of work. I love traveling, hotels, airports. I like seeing things, being there for people. She's dedicated and good at her work. We were agreeing, Walter Calder, that's an interesting report, but we were also agreeing that that is now and then is then, the time that, you, <laughs> <laughs> the time that you've been talking about in the 1970s and what have you. Uh, I'd like to invite you to take us back to that yeah. time because, and the, you know, this, the, the whole, all the issues around bodyguard security and all the rest of it. No? Well, the 70s were the time of two major uh, political trends. One was the East-West conflict and the other was a very ideological internal conflict inside Germany. And some parts of the 68, the leftist movement radicalized themselves into terrorism. And we, being good Germans, <laughs> had a very well-organized terrorist infrastructure, which meant a lot of uh, assaults on people, people getting killed, death threats, very much different to what we saw in the movie or in that little trailer. Yeah. So my family probably had more than 150 realistic death threats in those years. We saw many people from our close environment that got killed. We saw people that got kidnapped. We saw a lot of pain. Many police officers in those days wouldn't work but half shifts because their family said it's too dangerous to be around us. People were saying in my school, <coughs> get him out of school. He is a security risk to the other kids and to mm -hmm. the teachers. So in those years, it was a very much fearsome situation on the terrorist side and an isolationist situation as a young teenager, as a student, as a pupil, who is completely outside this normal bell-shaped curve. Well, OK, let's talk about it. Because, I mean, what you're talking about specifically, when you talk about the situation in Germany, it really all came to a focus in, in 1977. Yeah? 66, 77, 78, yes. Exactly, that phase. And you were then, you were born in 1963, so we're talking 13, 13 14, 14, 15, 15 right, yeah? yeah. And you were there, you yeah. were right at the, the heart of the storm, yeah? yeah and indeed. so what, what do you remember, I mean, you were talking very uh, evocatively about being bullied, and you can remember that very well. What do you remember as the 14-year-old, for example? Well, I remember being driven to school by people with submachine guns in their armpit. I was <sighs> driven to, uh, I, we had a high-security house back home. Uh, for a year and a half, we weren't allowed to play any further than 100 yards from the house. So my playing mates That's were police tough. officers. Yeah. My mother organized uh, old wood from the renovation of the uh, Ludwigshafen, our hometown police headquarters, so we could build ourselves a little tower. Mm -hmm. I wasn't invited for years to any uh, functions of my schoolmates, like a birthday party or anything. I was a complete outsider. Mm -hmm. I was the guy with the third eye. I was completely isolated. And everybody, so to speak, looked at us as a problem. 
We were a problem of security, we were a problem of handling, but we were never kids in those years. So that leaves very deep scars on how you feel about yourself, self-esteem, and obviously it leaves a big scar on why am I alive in the first place? What is my meaning? What mm -hmm. is my purpose in life? Is my purpose just to be some little thing on that stage? Hans Martin Schleier. Yeah. I've got to ask you about that, because sure. obviously that's, a, again, he was one of the, 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 the most prominent victims Indeed. of the terrorism in yeah. Germany. The, the, he was the head of the Employers' Federation. Right. He was murdered. In September by, by the RAF, yeah. Right. And you had a, when you, when you were in this phase, when you were, you were doing a lot of soul searching, you were trying yeah. to understand what was going on around you, you were trying to understand your relationship to your father, and then you met Hans Martin Schleier. I met him only two, three times in my life. The last time I met him was about six weeks before he was kidnapped and 10 weeks before he was assassinated. And for some reason, my dad uh, was late, running late. So we sat, just the two of us, in the office of my father in Bonn. And we were just talking, just like this. And I was asking him about terrorism. I was asking him about, do I have to be afraid? And then he said to me this big sentence, Walter, it's perfectly okay to be afraid. But don't worry, it's not going to happen to us. And as a 13-year-old, I took that as the word. Gospel truth. He is like yeah. a you know, very yeah. strong man saying this to me, irresponsible, irregardless of what he's done and who he is, but just somebody who says that to you, and mm -hmm. you want to hold on to that belief. And then four weeks later, that same man gets kidnapped in Cologne. His entire entourage is murdered. And a couple of weeks later, they find him assassinated and butchered in a car trunk in Alsace. And then I knew I can die tomorrow morning. And suddenly, my life turned differently because the person who had told me not to be afraid was dead a couple of weeks how, later. How did you get the news? Did your parents tell you or did you hear it on the news? Or how did well, it was the news. It was the news. The sh the sh it, was like, it was like a bomb exploding in your house. Well, it was it not just only a bomb exploding in the house. There was the no country. other issue in the German media. Mm -hmm. The entire country was searched. It was... Uh, things happening all over the place. And if you look back in the newspapers and in the TV news in those days, that was the number one topic together with the Lufthansa hijacking in Mogadishu. So for like weeks, the country was paralyzed. And I was sitting there and thinking, this man told me not to be afraid. And this man is dying. And they're not doing anything to help him. There's this famous video which shows him <coughs> saying, please, please do something. Yeah. Don't keep me waiting. Yeah. And I was thinking, well, what about me? If I were there, then the price tag would be 5 million marks and I would go as well. And if you're 13, 14, it is extremely difficult to handle this complexity of emotions, especially when you're completely alone. Because neither your schoolmates nor your teachers, anybody, nobody in your environment even thinks about talking to you. I'd like to say, and I really mean it, I think you've come out of that very, very well. Thank you. <laughs> uh, heavy stuff. Yeah, we're going to lighten it up just a little, little, little bit. Germany is a car country. They often say that one in ten jobs here is uh, directly or indirectly linked to what they call the automotive sector. But Germany is also a green country, I'm sure you know, and among the younger generation, at least, more and more people are shunning cars in favour of bikes and car sharing. Berlin is Germany's capital of hip, and here in Berlin, bicycles are hot, cars are not. I get where I'm going faster on a bike, and it's more fun. I don't miss my car at all. Driving a car in the city is a constant battle against traffic, speeding tickets, and the hunt for parking spots. That's not exactly the image of freedom and fun the auto industry wants to present. Trend researchers confirm, cars are out, bikes are in. People who ride their bikes or who walk are signaling that they take care of their health. That's also a status symbol. The guy who's sitting in his big car with his big belly, that's not it. It's the guy on the racing bike who's nice and fit. The numbers back that up. Ten years ago, only 8% of all journeys in Berlin took place by bike. Today, it's nearly twice that, 15%. 
Even business executives are getting in on the act. Berlin is home to the German parliament, and about 100 parliamentary delegates are said to ride to work on a bike, like Gero Storjohan, who's a member of the conservative Christian Democrats. I like the fresh air. And getting a fresh look at the city. And I get a bit of exercise too. Nowadays, fewer young people in Berlin are getting a driver's license, and fewer under 26-year-olds are buying a new car. And when they do need a car, many city dwellers are turning to car sharing instead. Ariana Ferschler prefers car sharing to owning a car. There's no hassle with parking spots, taxes, insurance, or repairs. If I need a big car, I rent a big car. If I need a small car, I rent a small one. It's very flexible. It gives me exactly what I need, and I'm much happier this way. Across Germany, nearly 200,000 people are registered with car sharing firms, and more and more join up each week. And if urban hipsters keep favoring bikes over a flashy new ride, the car may one day go the way of the dinosaur. Bikes and cars is our next topic, Walter Kohl. I mean, we've got to know you already as a very thoughtful person, as an mm. author of a very interesting book. You're also a businessman, and I think if we're going to talk about cars, you need to put your cards on the table <laughs> and explain, you know, what your angle is here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tell me. Well, my wife and I work in a company. We founded a company that is, does procurement services from Korea to Germany in the automotive industry. Production dies for metal bending, for metal parts for cars. So our personal destiny is very much linked with the future of the German car industry. Okay, okay. But cars are noisy and dirty. We could, do, we should do without them. Well, I think we should do without the old um, engine system of carbohydrate uh, propulsion. What we need is auto mobility, individual mm -hmm. mobility. If you look at a country like Germany, that's built on that individual mobility. The question is, do we have to have an engine that's 100 years plus in its fundamental concept? And I think it's time to change into a more modern, more ecological concept. But the fundamental principle of auto mobility, I think, uh, will be untouched. But uh, uh, you talk about a more modern, a more up-to-date concept for mobility. That could be an efficient, clean, integrated public transport system yeah. Uh, yeah. that would be the kind of thing that Germany could build and sell to, sell to Korea because it's such a densely populated country right. with so many people, you know? Right. If you look at big urban centres such as Berlin or Hamburg, definitely you can interconnect the different modes. If you look at the so-called flat country scene, it's different. So I think we don't need one solution, but we need a whole modular box of solutions and here is a great opportunity for the German car industry, again, to reclaim world leadership in this mm -hmm. and to have integrated systems that not just focus on the product, but on the total solution. And the solution means individual transport in its different ways, shapes and form. OK, I think we can agree on that. You do business between Korea and Germany. You have a Korean wife. Yeah. And one big issue in Korea is reunification. Yeah. The hope for and the prospects of reunification. You, of course, are the son of Helmut Kohl. Yeah, mm -hmm. who stands for reunification in <laughs> Germany. Yeah. Um, people must ask you an awful lot for your views on all that. Yeah, they do, and I speak a lot about unification with Korean partners. However, the situation in Korea is very different to the situation in Germany 1987, 1989, prior to unification. North Korea is a different country, much more isolated, much poorer, much more dramatical social situation. So I think the challenge of unification for South Korea is much bigger than it was in those days for the old West German government. And people in Korea, rightfully so, are worried about that. Mm -hmm. But one day uh, that I'm convinced of, something will happen that will then implode the current system in North Korea, and then things will just go at a staggering pace, and South Korea tries to anticipate that by having their own cabinet-level ministry of unification issues and by considering many things, but you can only plan so much. But it's going to be a huge task for South Korea to uh, digest that challenge. Mm -hmm. And having sat in the front seat of German reunification, as we saw earlier, 
What would your one piece of advice be to the Koreans if and when that moment in history does come? There has to be a concept to keep <coughs> people where they are. Because the big problem in Germany in 1990 was that 115 to 130,000 people left East Germany each month. So there was a time horizon when the country would quote unquote be empty. And you have the same situation in Korea. Seoul is only 40, 50 kilometers from the DMZ. And you have a first uh, Korean economic zone in North Korea, the Kaesong area. But what happens if 10, 15 million people were on the move? That would cause a collapse in the South Korean society. I'm fascinated by what you're saying. And we, we've got very little time left, yeah. unfortunately. So I'm going to give you like 20 seconds to tell me, how do you keep people where they are? By giving them hope, a future, and a clear perspective on how they can better their life. What a professional. That was just... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a 20-second answer. Got, yeah, very, very good. OK. I've indicated it already. We're running out of time, and I would really like to go through the, uh, the traditional Talking Germany quiz with you before the end of the show. Okay. First question, yeah, a big question, albeit. Uh, life is conflict or reconciliation? It's both, because one depends on the other. And in conflict, should we turn the other cheek or fight back? Uh, we should try to turn the cheek, but sometimes it's wise to fight back. You have to make a decision each time. You should not be calculable. <laughs> OK. Here's an interesting one, and I'm really, really fascinated to see what you're going to say. German reunification. Is it your father's personal achievement or something that would have happened without him? I think my father greatly furthered and propelled the process. Maybe it would have happened, but I'm very glad he was the right man at the right time at the right spot. I think that's a very good place to leave it for today. Thank Thanks very much for joining us today, Walter Kohl. Yeah? He's been a great guest. He's a man who got a really, really compelling story to tell. I'm grateful that he shared it with us today. If you've enjoyed his company as much as I have, then do come back next week. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss. <laughs>